Welcome back to The Morning Blend. This is the New York Times bestselling novel, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane by Lisa C. It is about the bonds between a Chinese woman and the daughter she gives up for adoption in America. The Washington Post writes about the novel, compelling, a lush tale with infused with clear-eyed compassion. This novel will inspire reflection, discussion, and an overwhelming desire to drink rare Chinese tea. I think I want some right now. Me too. We are pleased to welcome the author, Lisa C., to The Yellow Couch. She's on tour because the book is now available in paperback. Hello, Lisa. Hi. Thank Great you for to having see me. You. Great to see you here. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before we came on about the research that had to go into this book. Talk about that, because I think some people think, oh, you just sit down and start writing, but that's not the case. No, I did research on this book for a couple of years. I went to China up into the tea mountains to, you know, see what it was all about. I learned every step of processing tea myself. Self. I also, since this book is about adoption, I interviewed young women, sort of 18 to about 22, who had been adopted from China. These were young women all around the country. And then I also, because a lot of this book is about the Aka ethnic minority, which is a very unique group of um, people, they're nomadic who roam through a certain part of the world. And um, I did a lot of research about them and they were fascinating, fascinating people. Tell us a little bit about the, the, the promise of the book and what happens, because I think the, the concept of giving right. a child up for adoption it's very difficult. is really difficult. Right, so there's a young woman who gives birth to a baby high in the tea mountains of Yunnan. She's unmarried and she knows there's only one option for her. And so for the first time in her life, she walks down out of the mountains to the closest city. It's her first time she sees, you know, what we would think of as civilization. And there she abandons the baby and that baby is adopted by a family here in the United States. And I think that there's this sense uh, that we sometimes forget about that, you know, especially with the one child policy, that somehow these women in China wouldn't have a connection to their child that they've had to give away. And yet there is this incredible longing and um, loss that they feel. And then for those, you know, girl, primarily girls who've been abandoned in China and adopted here, as wonderful as their lives are here and as, in, you know, as much as they're loved here by their families, there still is a part where they um, long to know who their mothers were, who their parents were. And so I think that's where this sense of kind of loss and longing comes in in well, the story. And you said something there that people may or may not be familiar with, that one child policy and the difference between girls and boys because right. people are more likely to hang on to a son. Right, that's correct. Yes, if you can only have one, people would, would want to have that one be a boy in China. And so actually over the last 30 years that the one child policy was in effect, there were one million fewer girls born each year. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. So how do you come up with this concept? Why did this resonate with you? So actually I'm part Chinese. I know I don't look it, but I grew up in a very large Chinese American family in Los Angeles. I have about 400 relatives there. there are only about a dozen that look like me. Everybody else is still full Chinese. And so when I was a kid, when I looked around, what I saw were Chinese faces, Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese food, Chinese language. And so that's why I write the kinds of books that I do. But obviously I don't look like everyone else in my family. And these young women have had sort of the opposite experience. You know, many of them have been adopted into families where they're the only Chinese face in their family, maybe the only Chinese face in their class or their school or their church or their synagogue. So again, they've had kind of an opposite experience to mine. And that's why I've been thinking, I had been thinking about writing about them for about 20 years. Wow. And it was, um, I was going to the movies with my husband a few years back and I saw this young woman um, walking between her older uh, white parents and she had her hair up in a ponytail and her hair was swishing back and forth like this. And I, I had this vision of her as being kind of like a fox spirit in her family. And in Chinese tradition, fox spirits can be kind of naughty, they can be kind of mysterious mischievous, but in their best moments, they have this ability to bring great love and to create families. And so when I saw that 
you know, tail swishing back and forth. I thought, well, yes, she really is like a fox spirit in her family in the sense that through her presence, she had brought great love and it helped to create a family. And that's where you got the main and that character. And that was that was where I, I had this, like, this is the book to do now. That is I think fascinating. It's so neat. What wonderful research and what a wonderful product as a result of that, that great research and that caring about this topic in particular. And tonight, people have the opportunity to meet you. You have a book signing. It's at the Friends of the UW Golda Meir Lab Library, which is located on East Hartford Avenue here in Milwaukee, 7 p.m. tonight, um, where you, again, have a chance to, to meet Lisa, get a signed copy of her book, and learn more. It was wonderful to meet you. Yes, yeah, so wonderful to be here. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and your success of this book. It's Thank great. Thank you.